Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. In today's episode, uh, we'll have a look at a Tektronix TDS340 100 meg digital scope. I picked this up recently, and uh, most uh, or many of you ask usually, what do you pay for uh, instruments? And I usually oblige and tell you, but I run into an interesting situation where in order to keep my channel going and financed, what I do is I don't keep all of the instruments I feature around for too long. Some of them I sell. I don't I do not need eight oscilloscopes on my bench. But then you inadvertently run into the situation where people see the channel, you sell this thing and uh, a particular thing. And people go, well, how much do you want for it? I go, I want $100 for it, because they're, they're going for even more than that on eBay. But wait a minute, you just told us that you paid $35 for it, so uh, uh, you're overcharging us. Well, yes, if I were to buy and sell something, then maybe I should keep a 5% commission on it. But I do spend a bit of time fixing these things, obviously. I mean, going, buying, finding them, fixing them, and all of that. But people just don't understand or don't want to understand that, and uh, it gets into an unpleasant situation. So uh, on uh, certain things, or on most things that I'm going to repair, uh, because of the aforementioned reason, I'm no longer going to state how much I paid for it. If you want to see what something is worth, I still advise you to have a look on eBay. I bought this from the University Salvage Outlet here, and uh, they do have a test bench. I dragged it over to the test bench. Unfortunately, they don't have a variac on the test bench, but I plugged it in and uh, to test it, and it didn't work. And uh, Let's see what that looked like. We got it plugged in right now. So here's the power switch. You can hear a click and another click when you let go, which uh, kind of sounds to me like the uh, there is some sort of a power up relay that's pulling in when you push it. I hear nothing, no fan, no activity whatsoever. And then when you let go of the button, the uh, relay seems to disengage again. So there's no power coming into this. But I couldn't resist because uh, cosmetically it's in really nice shape. So let's do the obvious and check the fuse. To get out the fuse should normally be an easy thing. And even if you look in the service manual for this, it still tells you that there's a round fuse plug located approximately here that you just unscrew and check the fuse. But this one has that little sliding drawer underneath the IAC connector. And there's a slot here that you basically have to get a small screwdriver in to pry the fuse holder assembly out, which I've done. And it's made of plastic, so you've got to be careful to not mark it too much. You know, it doesn't even want to come out the rest of the way. And here we go. So let's get out the fuse. And... Uh, can't really see that, but looking at it here, it does look, it looks fine. Even though we know the pitfalls of using, just looking at it and figuring out if it's good by doing it that way, which is not what you should be doing. It says 3 amps at 250 volts, and uh, what it tells us here, it wants a 3 amp slow blow. So let us fetch a meter. And uh, check. 
check the fuse. So it does tell us that the fuse is good. And uh, and is the correct value. Always do a quick uh, short check by touching the neutral and the hot inputs. Even though that's not not going to tell us a whole lot right now because the fuse is gone. So let's uh, put the fuse back in. Now we can test. Okay, there's no short, and if we actually do a resistance test, it shows 130K. So there's no short, at least not on the primary side. Notice that this uh, device has no options installed, even though it does have all of the uh, stickers here to indicate what could be installed in there. It's kind of but too bad because it does have a VGA output, or has an option for a VGA output, which is kind of cool, but of course this one doesn't have anything. This is the base model with uh, no options ordered. One thing I realized when I bought it was this scope was awfully light uh, compared to the others, for instance, compared to a uh, TDS 460 and other scopes in its class. It just seemed very, very light to me. And uh, maybe that's because uh, it's devoid of any, any options. And also if you look at the front, it doesn't even have the floppy drive. It does have a blank panel in it. So, uh, I do, I was kind of afraid that, or I am kind of afraid that when I open this thing up, it's been completely cannibalized. But uh, I uh, weighed it, and it was just under 15 pounds, and then I looked in the uh, user manual, and it states that the scope's supposed to be 15 pounds dry. So, I guess it is the proper weight, but uh, there's only one way to find out. So, let's dig in. You need a T15 to take out four screws on this end panel here. And uh, once the end panel comes off, we have to pull off the case, and then we're in. So that gets off the rear plate, easy enough, uh, but if uh, don't start yanking on the case yet, like I have done before, because most electronic scopes of this era have another screw in front holding the case to the chassis, and it's easy to overlook that. And of course the second thing you need to do is uh, swing the handle out of the way because you won't be able to pull the uh, case back because the handle is on the case and I'll just get stuck on the front panel. So let's see if I can get this off. This probably won't happen. It is happening. It's always been a pain to get cases off. Oops. Sorry about that. But we're in. And uh, 
Looks awfully empty in here, doesn't it? So normally this is where all of the expansion cards fit in, but this one, uh, I mean, there's no connections running in here, so I guess if you buy an expansion card, it'll come with the cabling to connect it. But as we can see, I mean, it doesn't look cannibalized. It just looks like it never had anything. Of course, you know, we got the fan, the power supply mounted here, the uh, the video driver, and the CRT. The front panel, which we can glimpse through here. And then the part that gave me a bit of a start was looking at the back, because at first glance you go, Looks like the whole analog board is missing. But after checking some pictures online, that is not the case. They basically dumped everything on this board. Uh, has the inputs over here, and then a bunch of ASICs. And that gets connected to power and the display. That's pretty much all there is in there. So there you have it. They've uh, put everything on a single board. It does have the expansion connector here, but it doesn't look like anything was ever installed over here. And yes, as I said, online, that's what it looks like. There really isn't anything else in there. So let's see why she isn't firing up. So plugging it back in and pressing power, I can hear that same click and uh, the power supply sounds like uh, it's making continuous clicking noises, different than the uh, relay noises. So it uh, looks like the thing is trying to start up, but it can't. I let go of the button and everything goes away. So looking at it, you can kind of see the relay over here. And uh, it's just clicking from somewhere in here. Don't know if you can hear it, but it's the characteristic sound of uh, a, a uh, switched power supply trying to start up, but unable to do so. Oh, this time when I let go of the power switch, it continued running. Sure, that means something, but I have no idea what that means, so let's take out power supply. I made some quick tests by this uh, disconnecting uh, everything that's coming out of the power supply to see if any of the external devices, the front panel or the display are loading it down or have a defect. And uh, that, uh, uh, I'm unplugging the display didn't yield anything. Unplugging the main board you saw on the other side uh, doesn't yield anything either because you can't even, you can't turn it on. I guess the uh, this power switch, it's a soft power switch and it runs through the processor board and if you unplug the power board, guess what? Uh, then uh, you can't turn it on at all. And the clicking, no matter what I disconnected, other than, of course, the processor board, continued the clicking noises. Also the fan, I unplugged the fan, which is probably just a 12 volt connection here. That didn't make any difference either. So, yeah, to go on, we got to take it out. The power supply, that is. A lot of people have a knee-jerk reaction to when it comes to busted uh, power uh, switching power supplies, and that is, oh, it's it's a bad cap. It's a bad cap. Uh, that is not necessarily true. I've had uh, two instances on video where I fixed a small Sony TV that had a bad switcher in it, and it wasn't. It was a Zener diode, and. Uh, I had something else I can't recall now that also wasn't the capacitors, 
but there was a recent one where I fixed the Radio Shack Model 3 computer and that one actually, uh, the power supply failed and uh, it did have a bad capacitor which fixed it, but if you do a visual inspection on the Radio Shack our computer, I did a visual inspection and I could see that the capacitor was bulging on top and uh, that there was liquid seeping out or fluid seeping out the bottom so the electrolyte was coming out and that was clearly an indicator of a capacitor but in most cases I've seen it is usually something else now I started out by doing a visual inspection on all of the electrolytics here none of the tops are bulging and uh, there's also nothing seeping out of them I did uh, use an ESR meter on them while in circuit and the ESR was good on all of them. Of course being in circuit some of them, uh, some of them uh, won't measure the capacitance properly because of other components but there was no immediate uh, indication of anything gone wrong in here so what I'm suspecting is that it's something else. The uh, the service manual for this does not give you component level troubleshooting. It's basically do this and that and then replace the board. So uh, we're kind of on our own in uh, where to go and check for possible problems. And uh, from experience, I guess I'm going to start checking the heatsink mounted transistors and diodes first and see if I I luck out and find anything. So I poked around for a while and uh, I may have found something that looks suspicious in circuit. So uh, let's get it out and see how it behaves outside. This is a, a dual transit, a dual diode housed in a TO220. Schottky diodes, ultra fast, rated at uh, eight ohms each. And I was getting strange values out of it, so let's take it out and see what it says on the bench. Did I just say 8 ohms? I meant 8 amps per diode, but you knew that already. Great. So uh, here's the device. Let's set the meter to diode. And uh, I think the tab is connected to the uh, common cathode on this, but let's make sure of that. And it is. So first checking the uh, left side diode. Gives us a good voltage reading. Let's check, the, uh, check it in reverse and it still shows overload so it's open. Now to the other side, the right side diode. And lo and behold, that shows a dead short. And let's check it in the reverse direction. Still shows a dead short. Well, we may have found the culprit, or at least one of the culprits here. So let me go and tear through my parts bins and see what I can come up with. So after a lot of searching, I could not find an exact replacement part, but I found this guy. It does look used. Looks like I pulled it off some other switcher sometime in the past. But I checked the uh, specs online and uh, they all meet or exceed the uh, primary specs such as uh, the current handling capability, max voltage, and the uh, switching speed. So let's see what this one has to say. So the left side is good. 
Can't use a tab on this one because it's plastic. Eh, that makes it more difficult, but patience. All right, so the uh, left side diode measures okay. And so does the right side one. So, uh, yes, eventually I'll go out and uh, get myself an exact replacement, which, which are available. But for now, I'm going to give this one a try to see if that solves the problem or if we have to go and dig further. One of the problems is since that one came, the replacement came out of somewhere else, you can see that the pins have been cut and are significantly shorter than the ones on the original. So uh, let's see how well I can get that into place and uh, get the uh, and get it to make good contact with the heat sink. It did fit in. You can see it over here, uh, and with enough of the uh, pins poking through to make a good solder connection. The only difference is that the clip in this case uh, pushes against the uh, pushes against the tab, whereas if we look at its next door neighbor, which is the same part, we can see that the, because of the length of the leads, the clip actually pushes against the body of the uh, TO 220 package. So the only difference here really is that because there's more distance here, it's, this clip is probably pushing a little harder than this one. But there's a big uh, heat transfer st uh, sticker behind it. So we should be okay with this. Well, time to put it back in and see the fruits of our labor. Heat sinks back in. Hopefully I have uh, all of the internal connections plugged in correctly. It's got an AC connection. So let's go ahead and uh, test it. The fan starts up. It's a very good sign. The lights come on, which probably means here relay click and uh, it's up. But what does that screen say? Oh, we missed the startup, which probably tells you whether it passed. So let's power cycle it and see. what the startup says. This is great. Came up, the screen looked really nice. There is no magic smoke. Come on, you can do it. Power on self-check passed. Push clear menu to proceed. And there you go. There's one trace. And uh, let's push channel 2. I think they're superimposed right now. Yes, they are. And there's a second trace. It does look kind of noisy, but uh, these digital scopes tend to look like that. So what happens if we switch it to ground? It doesn't really make a difference. All right, let's uh, give it a signal and see if the channels actually work. Okay, let me uh, 
Let me get a BNC cable. Be right back. Now one thing I noticed that may be a problem here is it does have the battery backed RAM and real time clock module in here. That And the battery is inside this package and it's not replaceable. Well, not easily. Anything can be done, but I've looked into them and, and they're bonded inside. It's it's near impossible to change that battery. You have to get a new one. And I don't even know if this keeps all of the uh, calibration data in there and uh, if it's live and if it's not live. Am I, you know, what do I have to go through to calibrate it? But, uh, well... I guess uh, we can turn it on and uh, see if there's a way to display the clock and see what that says. Well, obviously at some point somebody turned on the uh, channel 1 frequency measuring part and it looked like it retained that. So let's go in and see uh, if we can display the clock. And uh, read out Options, display time. Set to off. So let's turn that on. And back out of here. And uh, it's a few minutes off, but uh, it's kept the time. I don't know how long this thing's been dead and unused and not powered up. But uh, looks like the battery in the RTC module is still good. Another thing I did while I was uh, poking around the board before repairing it was uh, just to make sure I took out the fan and plugged it directly into 12 volts to make sure it works. And it did work, but it was pretty noisy. It made a kind of a light grinding noise. But then I got distracted. I did something else while the fan was still running. And when I came back about 45 minutes later, the fan was quiet. So it must have had dust in the hub. And it just eventually blew it out because it's a normal sounding uh, Tektronix fan now. Well, let's check signals now. So far, so nothing. Oh, let me see if turning power on here. And there you go. There is, there's your sign display. Let's uh, turn off channel two and just look at channel one. Make sure it's actually triggering. Well, it must be triggering off channel one, but uh, Yes, and it is. And there you go. We got a sine wave. Let's switch to square. Nice square, but notice the frequency is pretty low. And of course, triangle. Very nice display. Let me bump up the multipliers on the function generator. And we use the, uh, where is it, the auto set button. There it is running at about 10 kilohertz. And uh, going faster again. Rock stable. Well, that's only 1 megahertz. Keep in mind this is a... Uh, this is a uh, 100 megahertz scope, but that's not too bad. If I uh, turn up the function generator to max, I guess the function generator goes to 3, three megahertz. And uh, causes an unstable histogram, but uh, there you go. So that's channel 1. 
So now let's go to uh, channel 2. We turn off channel 1 and uh, we center channel 2. And uh, let's auto set it. And uh, there's your triangle. Now this one, you know, <clears throat> at 3 megs, why did the uh, frequency <clears throat> go away? The clock's still up, but the frequency... <clears throat> oh, there you go. So it's still just above 3 megahertz. It looks like the uh, edges, the <clears throat> tops and bottoms are a little bit rounded on here. But it's a pretty nice looking display. Looks very characteristic of the early uh, TDS series. <clears throat> so I think we have success. Things are back together again and it still works. One thing that remains to be done is uh, I want to go in and run the diagnostics from the menu so it gives us a detailed report of uh, what got tested and uh, what the results were. So we go to diagnostics and uh, OK. So it'll go ahead and run the diagnostics. Doesn't take or shouldn't take very long. Some relay chatter and uh, it pretty much, not pretty much, it passed everything. And the next thing to do would be to go back into the utility menu and let it calibrate itself. So let's do that. So it's calibrating the signal paths. This is going to take a while and uh, we'll report on it when it's done. So it successfully did the signal path compensation and uh, what we need to do now is uh, push clear menu and uh, that's it. As a last thing, let's check the uh, compensation signal. Not, no, the calibration signal. And there it is. So what remains to be done is not much. I mean, uh, one of the things was this thing was completely clean. Normally stuff out of the university has stickers all over it, uh, calibration stickers, inventory stickers, all that sort of stuff. This one was completely clean, so it looks like somebody had this in their own personal lab for a while and removed all traces of where it came from, but uh, when it decided to not work anymore, it ended up at the university salvage again. Of course. What some of you may be thinking is, uh, I left out something big that needs to be done, and that is to go through and uh, recap the whole thing. And uh, eventually that needs to be done, especially in the power supply, but for now everything is running just fine. And uh, as I've mentioned before, I usually won't go in and wholesale replace everything after visual inspection and checking it. With a, and checking the caps with a meter doesn't reveal any obvious problems. I leave it the way it is. The final word is, there's a lot of help that can be found online, but if you uh, look at the keyword uh, uh, clicking uh, switch mode power supplier, so the first thing that 90% of the people say is go in and replace all of the caps, uh, my advice is check the caps first. If you see any caps that look suspicious, take them off the board and check them off the board. And if you don't see anything bad, 
start checking the other components, which is essentially what I did here, and in this case obviously found a bad component that prevented the uh, power supply from starting up, yet didn't cause a short for it to blow its fuse. So get suggestions, uh, get suggestions off the internet, but uh, in the end use your own head and use a logical approach to fix these things. It's a nice scope, hats off to Tektronix, they know how to build scopes, even though this thing is probably a uh, mid to late 90s model, so it's pretty old, but uh, it runs nice, and at, at, 100, uh, at 100 meg bandwidth, it's more than enough to check uh, vintage, uh, a lot of vintage digital, digital equipment and also uh, audio signals. So uh, please support the channel, subscribe, thumbs up, and uh, we'll see you next time, depending on what I can dig out to repair and or look at for then. Have a good one.